Um, I understand that you all come from a fairly diverse background. So please stop and ask if you have any questions, if something that I'm saying is not terribly clear. All right, so should we get started? OK. Um, like the title suggests, we're going to be looking at tandem running here, tandem running, and thinking of this as a method of recruitment, right? So I want to start off with what is recruitment, and most of you would be seeing advertisements for job recruitment. It's a very common thing. When you open any newspaper, there's job recruitment. What does this mean? What is the implication of this? And to tell that in some detail and put a human angle to it, I want to start off with this slide where there is an individual and this individual has the power or effectiveness only because he can recruit, correct? Do you, you do understand that uh, an individual on his own, whatever the post be, is not good enough if he has to stop crime, which is what his job is, unless he can effectively recruit more individuals into this action and maybe across larger areas as well. That is the only way a policeman can be effective, so to speak. So recruitment really is the action of enlisting new members for a task or for an occupation, as the case may be. So coming back from the humans, uh, we want to be seeing that what are the tasks that require recruitment. In this particular case, it's there, it's to let us stop a crime. But what are the other kinds of tasks? And tasks that a single individual <coughs> cannot handle in an efficient manner. Can we think of this as requiring recruitment? Right? So there's a whole lot of food that is present here, which is a desert. And there's a single ant that finds it. The question is, will this single individual ant be effective in harvesting the food that is present here? And of course, the answer is no. No matter how many trips this ant makes, this resource will require more individuals to be recruited to the job. You understand what I'm saying, right? Same is the thing with a honeybee and a whole plant that is flowering. It's full of nectar and pollen, which are the food sources for this honeybee. And it's really no good for a single individual to be effectively taking all of this resource back to their colonies, right? So uh, what are the contexts? Both of this, of course, is to harvest food. The previous picture I was showing is protection. And these colonies of ants, bees, and wasps, the social systems, even termites, will come back to the hive and perform one of these two dances. And through these dances, and I will not be getting into the detail of what the dance is, because that's not important, but the dance will allow individuals to recruit their colony members to the resource. Right? So the dance will give information about the distance at which the food is present, the kind of food that is present, the direction in which this food is present, and the vigor with which the bee is dancing will tell the nest how much food is present. If there's a huge amount of food, then the forager who is showing this will be doing a lot of trips of dancing, very vigorous dancing. So they will have all of this information from the dance. Now, chemical trails that is laid by ants also has information definitely about direction. And it also has information about relative quantity, because more the amount of food, stronger is the trail. Right? And as you can imagine, the honeybees will be flying and going out. So finding their path in flight is a different cup of tea as compared to following a chemical on the ground. Correct? So this chemical trail is something that I'm sure all of us have seen. The waggle dance, not so much. And it's really spectacular. People have been working on it for many years now. And we think of this as a complete language altogether. Now. Another context in which colonies have to recruit their members, and 
in this case, not a specialized group of foragers, but the entire colony has to be recruited into a task is colony relocation. So what do we mean by colony relocation? The nest in which the colony is living right now, the current home, so to speak, which I've symbolized over here, becomes unhabitable, right? Why does this happen? Because there can be rains, there can be physical damage to their nest structure, or there can be predation which has damaged large part of the nest and taken away multiple elements in its nest. There can be competition from neighboring colonies, and all of this will make the colony pack up and move from one place to another place. So place A to B. What are the kinds of uh, colonies that do it? Ants do it, wasps do it, honeybees also do this. But occasionally they would have to move out. Another reason for moving from one place to another is part of reproduction. When one colony has to reproduce and become two colonies, then a subset of the individuals will go and make a new nest. So in both of these contexts, a large number of ants, for example, would have to go from one place to another. Right? So this is the context. Now in addition to this, for reproduction, yes, there is splitting, but otherwise the entire colony would move. Anybody who gets left behind uh, are doomed to die, because if the queen is not present, then that colony will not survive. As compared to wasps and bees, the one difference that ants have is that the ants would need to carry the egg larva pupa and as well as any stored resource with them when they're walking from one place to another. Right? The bees would take a little bit of the honey that is present in the hive inside their mouth, carry this in a pouch and go to the new place. But all the egg ones, the brood, the egg, larva, pupa, is abandoned when they move from one place to another, as compared to ants, which will be taking all their resources while they march from one place to another. This is really good because you are holding on to all the resources, but it adds complication to the process itself of moving from one place to another. All right. So uh, it depends on what species. In most cases, she would be moving by herself. Oh, all right, yeah, yeah. Uh, in this particular case, the question was, will, will the queen be carried or will she be walking by herself along the chemical trail? Right? And the answer is most of the time she walks by herself. Little bit of, uh, no, the honeybees have to abandon most of their resource, which is the nest itself, the wax that is present, the honey that is present, a large quantity of it and also the egg ones, the egg, larva, and pupa, right? So this is an insect. So the queen would be laying eggs. The egg will hatch and become a larva. The larva's job is to eat a lot, pupate, and the pupa will like, close into an adult. The adult honeybee is the picture that I showed you before. And remember, the adult honeybee cannot grow anymore. She can just age, and her age is about 30, 40 days when she dies. This is the cycle in which they live. And when they're moving from one place to another, they will have to abandon all the egg larva pupa, and they just have to fly away from their old nest to make their own new nest. So they're losing a lot of resources as compared to ants, where they will carry it with them. All right. So I was interested in a particular species of ant called Diacoma indicum. And this ant, I'm studying it in this part of our country. We know that it is present in India as well as in Sri Lanka for sure. Uh, very little about this ant is known, and we are one of the first groups to be looking at this species of ant. For this ant, if we are going to be looking at relocation, it's nice to see what is their home, right? What does it consist of? So if you're taking a walk around, you will see just a hole in the ground, and this is what their entrance looks like about a one centimeter diameter hole. And sometimes they choose to decorate it with this dead caterpillar skin that's present over here, maybe a few leaves occasionally. But otherwise, it's just a hole in the ground. If I take a section of this, 
I get a tunnel and a chamber. So it's a relatively simple structure, just a simple tunnel with a chamber in it. And if I want to look at their architecture, which we have started doing, we can pour some aluminum into this entrance. Terrible for the ants, but what it does give us is the three-dimensional structure of their nest, which we can study across seasons and so forth. All right. So as you see, this is the entrance. There is one chamber here, and then there's a runoff tunnel. That's what we're seeing in general as a structure. What is inside of this chamber? Adult ants and brood, which I was mentioning a minute back, eggs, different stages of larva and pupa. And of course, the reproductive individual, who is called the gamma gate in our case. Now, is it good enough for us to look at just all the ants that are present? They're about one centimeter in size, and all of them are identical black. So if I need to study anything further, the first step I have to undertake is to mark these ants with different colored paints. This is what we have done here. So this is yellow, white, white, yellow, yellow, green, and so forth. So now they have individual IDs, right? a roll number, so to speak. And now we follow their behavior and activities at an individual level. I know exactly what is the role that white dash dash played in the entire relocation. Right? How much work did she do? Did she carry anything? What was her job? This entire profile I can get by making her making the colony relocate. All right. So this is the system that we're working on, the platform that we'll be looking at. Yeah? Uh, so when we're doing observations, it depends on what particular behavior is of interest. So the entire colony and the average size of the colony, I should have mentioned, is about 80 to 90. Uh, so it's not that very large number because I can get individual uh, things. Whereas colonies of ants can range, for those of you who do not know, from about 20 to millions. Right? And if your species has you know, millions, then the way to deal with it will be very different as compared to this. I have a comfortable size. The largest colony we have collected is around 250. So we can mark every individual and keep track of what they do. And to aid in this process, we video record the process so that you can go back, rewind, and take a look at all the activities that is happening. All right? So yeah. Yes. Yes, I, I, I'm just coming to it. So uh, one of the things which was totally curiosity driven uh, is these are subterranean nests. That means they live under the soil, correct? So have you wondered what happens to these subterranean creatures during the monsoons, right? A huge amount of water. What is our levels of water that we're talking about? The area in which I study this, if we go from uh, June to June, that's an entire year, the average temperature is the solid line, and the average rainfall is this other line. And as you can see, there's a nice peak here, and it's starting from here itself, and this pretty much here. If you look off the levels, it's more than one centimeter rain almost every day. So, and this happens for a long period of time. So what happens to creatures who live under the ground? What happens to my ants? That's what we were curious about. And when you don't know what happens, the best thing is to go take a walk in the area that these creatures live. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, Shweta Shri, uh, who is attending this workshop, and he's some right here in the back, uh, got curious about this. And she took multiple walks around where the ants live to characterize the natural history of these ants during monsoon. Where do they live? Are they present at all? The answer is yes, they're present. They're flourishing, in fact, because the other insects upon which they prey is there in large abundance. So they're doing well. And we wanted to see sampled different numbers of nests in the three seasons, pre-monsoon, monsoon, and monsoon, post-monsoon seasons. And we find that the nests are present, but they're present at higher elevations. So they abandon ground living and go to higher elevations when the monsoons are there. In addition, if we look at how big their tunnel is, we find that they make shallower tunnels during the monsoon season as compared to pre and the post monsoon season. So for those of you who are 
not very uh, um, informative or uh, know about these graphs, let me explain that this is the median, this is the interquartile range, this box, and these whiskers represent the range for the data that we are collecting. And we do non-parametric statistics like man with me u test. And if it is A, B, and A, that means that this B, the one that is different, is significantly different compared to both of this. Yeah. No, not yet. In the initial stages, we were used to poke a stick right inside and see what is the depth to which it will go. And in the monsoon period, we find that the, it will not go too deep, and you can measure it, of course, and get the numbers of what the tunnel is. All right. So the building shallower nests, as well as uh, living in higher elevations. Right. No, the monsoon period is for a couple of months. Yeah. Uh, she's asking if uh, the monsoon period is small and that's why the tunnel length is small. Uh, no, these are two separate things. The uh, length of monsoon is for months and the tunnel length that they have to make can be dug up in it one or two days. That, that would not be the case. All right. Why is it shallow? Yeah, we feel that it is shallow and more spread out because even in case the water does come in, they can exit from there faster. And there's lesser chance of damage. This is a pretty much of a hypothesis as of now, but that's what we believe. All right. Okay. So in addition to these two parameters, the entrance itself changes. And this is to answer one of the questions in the back as to what is decorations at the entrance. So uh, I have a picture here for the pre-monsoon period and the post-monsoon period. And these are relatively undecorated. Whereas the monsoon period, they do increase their decorations as well as their entrance a uh, great deal. What do they do? They bring mud from different places, <laughs> consolidate it, make it into a mound. And after this mound is made, they put various things like cuticles of insects, twigs, and leaves that overhang on the entrance so that the water can run away uh, instead of fall directly into their tunnels. Right? So that is the difference that we see. And by testing it statistically, we know that more mounds are built during the monsoon. And the building index, which characterizes how many pieces of uh, decorations are present, how much um, mounts are present and so forth also allows us to conclude that they do two things. Uh, one is that they go to higher elevations and then they modify their entrance. So both of this is their reaction to the monsoon period. Now if the rain is causing all this, we ask the next question, can ants anticipate that once rain starts falling or there's a water stress, can they automatically relocate and go to a higher elevation? Is this what is happening? Is this some way hardwired into their system? That's the next question we wanted to ask. Yeah. No, there will be only one of these. Yeah. The question was, will they have multiple entrances during monsoon as compared to rest of the year? The answer is no, there's only one single entrance. OK, so next we asked, uh, if I were to put a colony in, let us say, over here, and these are pillars which are different distances, connect them to alternate nests, one at higher elevation and one at lower elevation. And now, subject the colony to a water stress and ask the question, just because of the water stress, will ants relocate to a higher elevation? Do they have this information already that if there is water falling on them, it's better to go to higher elevations rather than lower elevations? So in order to do this, of course, you have to do a control experiment where you make them relocate without a water stress. And then the numbers we saw, we did 16 colonies, is that eight colonies went to the higher elevation, and seven colonies went to the lower elevation. As expected, it is random. They either go up or down on a control situation. So when I give water, what happens? Um, eight of them went up, and three went down. And statistically, this is not different from the control. So we had to conclude that no. They do not assess high levels of flooding with the idea that they have no more nests that will be viable at this height and have to go at a higher elevation. So they do not seem to be wired into this information. Yeah. No. 
no uh, in the social insect groups they are very very particular about who they live with so even if a single individual from another colony comes there will be aggression towards this individual and they will be thrown out so yeah even if colonies split and then you bring individuals from one place to the other and reintroduce them there will be aggression yeah so they are very particular about who they are living with Yes, yes. So uh, the question being, instead of 16 colonies, can I do with a much larger number? So yes, one can possibly try by doing with larger numbers, but 16 itself is not too bad, and the effort and time it takes to do it is non-trivial. So given that trade-off, 16 was not too bad, but yes, one can check with larger number of colonies. Okay, they are not genetically identical. The mother possibly is uh, similar for all of them. But over time, what we know is the relatedness values can come. Uh, it is expected to be theoretically 0.75 because this is a hymenopteran system. And I don't have the time to tell you why, but it's expected to be 0.75 between two sisters, right? But studies show that it may not be that. The values are closer to 0.5 to 0.6. That's the range at which they are. Uh, however, what makes the differences between colonies is the queen that they have, the smell of the queen, the food that they eat. That seems to be, and this is carried on their cuticle, and that is sensed by the antenna. So this seems to be the reason why they're coming apart. All right. Yes, in the control, we do make them relocate. Everything else is identical, except that you do not give them water as a stressing factor. Why would they relocate? Yeah, so I would come to the protocol of this. We are doing this quite routinely. The ants, as I said, are subterranean. They like to live in dark chambers. So if I provide light, they hate it. They will want to get out of this place and go to a new house. So they, we house them in a petri plate, which is closed one on top of another, and with a red cellophane paper on top. So if I were to remove the top petri plate, they hate it up there, and they try to go find the new nest. And this is what we use as a routine manner in order to stress them to make them get out of one place and move to another. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The way we do it is too drastic. So if there was a small hole or something, and you provide the material, they will try to repair it, but uh, we do it really drastically. This cover or no cover, so that you know we can keep the conditions constant. And for that sake, it's so drastic, and there's no material available because it's an artificial nest in the lab. Uh, they do not try to uh, uh, repair it. Instead, they will go find temporary shelters in the darkest spot within the small uh, plastic box. That we have. Okay, they are flourishing. The numbers of brood in the colony as proportional to the adults, that ratio increases. Yes, so they go to nests where the flooding is reduced. So they have to take care of that brood, and they are doing something to it. And what they're doing is what we're trying to quantify. Yeah, OK. Does the strategy of uh, dealing with external stress, be it monsoon or some, some other, it depends upon the size of the colony? Mm -hmm. um, we would have to study this, and it would be good to study this in species where the numbers are from 20 to, let's say, thousands. Right? So in the limited scale that we have seen from small numbers to 20s to about 150, 200, we are not seeing too much of a response to that. Uh, but if we were to increase this and go to another species, then maybe there are differences. And in at least one other ant species in the world, people have looked at differences between small, medium, and large colonies in their response to stress. Yes, for one other species in the world. But for this, we have not yet seen such a thing. For example, if uh, a colony is of a bigger size, like few, having few thousand individuals, they might split into different colonies and relocate yes. at different places. Yes. Yeah. yes, and depending on the time of the year as well. So if it is you know, amicable for reproduction, then yes, that would be one way to go about doing it. 
one would have to look at it. In our species, it does not. Okay. Um, all right. So this is not inbuilt. If you give a high water stress, banks are not necessarily going to the higher elevation. So they seem to relocate and go to higher elevations in the natural system because there are no nests available at lower elevation. That is the conclusion that we had to draw. And we move on to the relocation paradigm and look at what are the other strategies. The target is to go from the old nest to the new nest. We already looked at chemical trails. Carrying is where adults will just simply pick up another individual and just walk along. Uh, this would be one way to ensure that this other person reaches the new destination. And uh, this is something that's also uh, seen in the ants. But the behavior of interest to us in this talk is really tandem running. And I wanted to show you what this tandem running looks like. Let's first look at the video. It would be quite self-explanatory, and then I can tell you. So the individual in the front, which is dash red dash, is a leader. And she knows where the new nest is. She recruits one follower at a time. This is white gold dash from the old nest, walks in physical contact with each other all the way through, and they will reach the new nest soon. All right, so this is the entrance of the new nest, and she has brought one member from the old to the new nest. Right? This is the behavior called tandem running. And as you can imagine, the leader will now drop off her follower here go back to the old nest, pick a second one, bring and drop her here. Sometimes the follower can become leaders, but most of the time that is not the case. All right? Correct. It would be great to know. As soon as you give me a colony, I can tell you who the leaders are, right? We are trying to do it. Uh, the first guess is, are they the foragers? Foragers are animals who go out any case. And the answer is no. Only 50% of the foragers become leaders. So how many leaders are there? About 20, 25% of the colony tends to become leaders. Then we can ask, how much work do the leaders do? Do all of them do equal amount of work? The answer is no. There are few who do a lot of work. And most of the leaders just do one or two, and they stop after that. Yeah? OK. Yes, they belong from the same colony. We would not expect them to be much different than their nestmates. The age is understood to be one of the criteria. We expect that older individuals will become leaders. Yeah. OK, this is some basic thing about ants. Possibly I should have mentioned. The entire colony consists of only females. The males look morphologically different. They have a pair of wings. And their only purpose is really to mate and then following that, they fly. They do not participate in this activity. Males are the only ones which are carried um, by these leaders from their old nest to the new nest. Any kind of relocation, tandem running is observed. Excellent, excellent. So tandem running also happens during relocation during slave raids and recruitment towards food, the three categories that I was mentioning to you. Uh, however, we are studying it only during relocation per se. And the reason for that is diacoma indicum shows it only during relocation. These ants are scavengers. They eat small insect prey. They go around, find whatever prey they can get, and bring it back individually. They do not recruit. We think that they do not have a chemical tree. So they use only tandem running. And the physical contact is necessary, because otherwise the follower will not know where to go. Right? And in case a follower and leader get separated, the leader will wait. And then the follower will look around for a bit, go touch her abdomen again. The pair is established, and then they walk along. All right? Yeah. Yes. 
for food or for other adult eyes as well. Okay. Um, okay. So the clock tells me that I have 13 minutes. And maybe I'm into one third of what I was wanting to say. Uh, I'm happy to have the interactions. I mean, that's I, I'm happy you understand it. It's not the point that I want to tell you all that I've been doing. Uh, but I want to set the platform that this is tandem running, a really interesting behavior, part of the recruitment process. And you can ask a whole bunch of questions based on this platform. In the next few minutes, I'll browse through one or two questions that we have asked without going too much into the detail of the result. Is that all right? So that we can carry on. All right. So this behavior of tandem running, as you can imagine, is understood to be a primitive behavior because it's very dependent on individuals. A few leaders will make all the difference. Whereas for a chemical trail, it's not the case. Okay? Second, there's a high chance of failure. If the leaders are removed or eaten away by a predator on their way, then that's it. It's the end of the story for relocation, so to speak. And one can imagine that possibly this is slower as compared to walking en masse on a chemical trail. Okay? So people believe, and of course, the whole scenario of the chemistry the gland that produces the trails, all of that is absent. And so they think that this is a relatively primitive behavior. You can flip that around and ask, all right, you're telling me that it's relatively primitive, fine. But nevertheless, ants are undertaking this. And to our eye, it's working out just fine. So I flip the coin around and ask, what are the advantages of tandem run? Fine, whatever, it's primitive, but it's still being used. So then what is the plus point of doing tandem running instead of a chemical trail? What could be the reasons that ants are doing tandem running as compared to the other methods of carrying and chemical trail? One of the things, more like an encryption among ants. So the root is encrypted. Right. So uh, let's say there is a nice source, food source like the laddu. And if you have made a trail, if one colony has made a trail, it's very useful for the other colonies to come there. Just take the trail to get to the same food source, right? So that can be avoided. Is that an answer? In this particular case, no, because the food source is individualized. Like it's one small insect that is dead. So uh, for indicum, that does not make sense. But in general, the trail is laid within the territory of this colony. And into this territory, other colony ants will not be coming. So it will reduce that any case. But if the trail is provided, yes, other colonies will follow on that. Right. So uh, just for the sake of time, let me move on and ask, what are the advantages of tandem running? Can these leaders change their mind after having selected one nesting place? Right. So nest A is what my destination is. And if you were to lay a chemical trail, you would expect that a large number of ants have to go on the trail, wait for this relatively volatile chemical to evaporate, and only then will the traffic to that nest stop, which means there are a large number of erroneous walks. When the nest is not good, if you recruit to that place, it's a waste of time and effort. Whereas in tandem running, one would not expect such a waste to happen. Right? So we can ask the question, how flexible is the decision to adapt a nest or to reject it? And in order to do this, we do the following experiment. This is performed by Anup, who is another of my PhD students. And what we do is we call this as a flexibility experiment, where in a small arena, we have the old nest present here. We make them relocate. When half the colony is present in this new nest, we take the lid off the new nest right, and place it back in the old. What does that mean? What was not good has become good now. And what you the leaders thought was a good available nest has become suddenly poor. Right? So you have to, we have wanted to check, will the leaders assess this? Will they make erroneous walks? Right? And this is exactly in the midway of the relocation. So the workload is expected to be equal if there are no errors. All you will have to do is get the ants back from here to this nest. Correct? Are you with me so far? So we did this experiment. And as you can see, we did follow 1,359 transports, 4,250 transporters. And we find that, yes, the workload as well as the number of 
transporters leaders remained constant right only thing that changed is they took 50% more time in conducting their relocation right and uh, the error that they showed how many wrong walks did they make wrong walks as in the number of walks that went to a nest which is not amicable for them to live is between 1 to 2 percent and it is comparable between control and the flexibility what is a control where you just remove the lid of the new nest momentarily and put it back because all said and done we are doing a manipulation that takes care of that manipulation and we find that the, there is almost no error there are hardly any wrong walks done by the leaders they're changing their destination without making any problems with their decisions it's easy for them to be doing it it looks like only thing the cost they pay is in terms of time they take 50 percent extra time and in order to account for this we looked at the latency of leaders what do we mean latency is the time that is taken between one tandem run to the next tandem run and we ask what is their latency following this manipulation which is these two bars here and we find in the flexibility experiment leaders took the same amount of time to reassess the entire arena like when they did their first tandem run and because of this reassessment they were successfully able to recruit to the correct site in all of the cases and following the manipulation they took the same time as the first tandem run and reinitiated these walks and all the colonies successfully got into the destination list. Okay. Now we wanted to characterize tandem running itself. There is only one characterization in a different species in 1974 <coughs> of what tandem running is. So we divided this into three components which is the initiation, how does it get started? What is the path along which they go? And how does this stop? What is the behavior that is responsible for both of this? So given the time, I will not get into the details of this and the video of this. And this experiment was done by Rajbi as part of her thesis. Uh, let me skip the initiation and termination um, and go to what we call the path. What is the way that they're taking? What is the route that uh, these tandem leaders are taking? And how different is it? So if you pay attention, uh, there is a pair of these ants which are walking together in tandem here. There's another one that is starting from here. This is the old nest. Here is the new nest. And this is a sand arena that we use. The distance between this and this is about a meter and ants of course remember is about a centimeter. So in this particular video I will not know the individual identities but I can easily follow or track what is the movement of this pair in this grid that we can generate. Right? Following this we track about 250 different tandem runs to understand what is the manner in which tandem runs happen and we find that not a single member is lost during this process. Every single individual is tandem run or they find their way into the new nest and you can follow either the leader or the follower in the given individual tandem run and we did this separately and we find that leaders face very few interruptions and if they have an interruption as in a follower tandem and the leader break up the leader will resume with somebody else a different follower and the follower tends to have more interruptions and she typically needs two leaders in order to reach to the new nest right but none is lost yes so they seem to be she's asking is there a reason why they go along the edge possibly yes um, we have to do many more experiments we have to do it where the shapes are you know maybe a circular Thing, so forth in a rectangle and given the lighting situation this is the case but one would have to do many many more to be sure that it's an edge bias that's what that is what we speculate um, that they have a notion of what where is that address and remember they were living in a separate area now I have picked that nest and just put them into this arena they explore the arena, 
find the new nest and they seem to know how to, where it is. So typically they do around three trips from the old nest to the new nest before they start tandem running. That's what we see. Uh, so one has to do displacement experiments or memory experiments where you can keep them for long periods away from the arena, reintroduce and see can they go to their old nest or the new nest. Yeah, so actually both this question as well as what you're saying is what Shweta Shri is working on right now. Uh, and she is going to be here for a much longer period than I am. So uh, definitely ask her. The answer is yes. Uh, the scouts do tend to become uh, the leaders. Take longer time to find it, depending on who the individual is. Uh, but eventually they will find the entrance. So the lost cases of the leader or the follower is zero. So by eventually they would just keep on exploring until they find the entrance. Yeah. Okay. Um, how much time do I have? Five more minutes. All right. So um, all I wanted to point out is holding the brood uh, does not seem to make a difference because one would expect that if in a tandem run, um, a follower is holding a brute, like a pupa in this case, and then tandem running, you would expect that she can't see well or there may be a problem because there's a physical hindrance. But we find that no, there is no problem holding this brute. And number of interruptions are comparable. Now, the next step really was to track these ants, like I was telling you, and quantify two parameters, the efficiency as well as the speed at which they're carrying out this job, right? In order to do this, uh, Anup got some help from Dr. Joby Joseph in writing a MATLAB program for this. And using this, we were able to get to the next stage where I look at efficiency. And in this y-axis, if it is one, that means they're going at the shortest distance between the newest and the oldest. If it's any number lower than that, that means they're taking a more circuitous route. And we find that, in general, a returning leader, a leader who is coming back from the new nest, or a leader who is simply taking one piece of brood and going from the old nest, tandem running individuals, or tandem running individuals with a brood, effectively transporting two items, one brood and one adult at the same time, have comparable efficiency. They are not taking separate routes based on who they are tandem running with. Further, if we look at the speed, the y-axis here is speed, and we have uh, looked at uh, several leaders, at least 50 leaders for each of these cases, and we find that the returning leader is the fastest, as you would expect. She is not having anybody else behind her or any brood item with her, and her speed is about 6.6 .6 centimeters per second, and the slowest, of course, is individual, a leader who has a follower with brood with her. Right? We will look at the number. And intermediates are individual with just a piece of brood and individuals who are tandem running. So the highlights of tandem running per se is no colony members are lost. It allows for very flexible decisions regarding the <coughs> nests. It allows for coupling brood as well as adult transport within a single trip, which is unheard of. It has not been documented in other species of ant. Um, and that's what we were able to report. And the path seems to be uh, not dependent on who the follower actually is. However, we need to compare tandem running with other modes of recruitment. Right? That's what we started off with. Where does tandem running stand as compared to other modes? In order to do this, we go back to the first slide, which is honeybees. And remember 6.6? .6 centimeters per second is what was the value for dicoma indicum. And just the first glance at this will tell you that flying is, of course, much better and much faster. And maybe one should not allow ourselves to compare, you know, walking with uh, flying, so to speak. So let's go to something that makes a little more sense. Other species that does tandem running, right? And only two other documented uh, values for speed is present two species of ants. 
and compared to them, walking is comparable to the one species that we know. Uh, however, there is huge variation here. And remember, we can't put all ants into the one same basket and say what is their speed because individual sizes of ants are very different. Right? You have yourself seen really small black ants and large black ants. So if I say one centimeter ant, how fast does it walk as compared to a point uh, five centimeter ant, it is different and that would not be a fair comparison. So what we do is convert this into body lengths per second. So that makes it a relative understanding. And based on that, we know that Dakama is walking at a good speed. She's carrying at much higher speeds than what is known. She's tandem running much faster than other species. Right? Nevertheless, we really want to know and compare this with chemical trails. Right? So let's look at species that use chemical trails. Another species, this is, this is present in India, and this study was done in India, whereas this is not. And what we find is that the walking speed of a returning leader is really comparable to what the other speeds are in, in terms of relative body lengths per second. Carrying, it's a little lower than this, but well within the range. And tandem running is 4.35 body lengths per second, right? And this one is as good as or within the range of what chemical trails are able to achieve, which is 0.76 body lengths per second and 5.84 at the best. Right? Now, instead of paying so much attention to individual numbers, we can compute what is the relative decrease in speed when you're walking along a chemical trail or you're carrying something, right? So 100% is when an individual is walking by herself. And this number 11% means that if this individual is carrying some other uh, brood or a food item, the speed reduces to only 11% of what she's capable of walking on her own, right? And if we do this, we find that the range for chemical trails is from 11 to 96%. And diacoma indicum is doing really good with 70, about 70, both carrying and well as right? Yeah. I'm, yes, this would be the last piece. Uh, so, even though tandem running is considered a primitive method, in D indicum, the speed that they achieve is well within the range of chemical trail species, and maybe it's not all that compromised because they're using tandem running, and one would have to redefine whether looking at what is called primitive methods, um, is that valid, is that equally functional? Or you know, one has to redefine this idea about just primitive does not mean that it is ineffective or that it may not be as functional, it may be equally functional. It's only a matter of looking at it in some more detail. And to finish this up, of course, I would have to say that all of this came from an artificial arena within the lab. I would love to go out and do this in the natural habitat of the ants itself. The second thing is we have to vary distances. And we would have to do colony level comparisons because at the end of the day, how much time does a colony take to move from place A to B is what matters, not individual speeds of the leaders. Okay? So that's what we would be trying to do in the next step. And we would, of course, have to look in our habitat, what do other species that use chemical trails and carrying uh, bring about. So with this, I would like to stop. Uh, thank you for your attention and I hope you enjoyed a little introduction to tandem learning per se. <laughs>